Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching Tesla Time News. Episode 261 on Now You Know. We are brought to you by our amazing Patreon patrons. Without them, you wouldn't be seeing this show right now. So head over to patreon.com slash now you know, and there you'll find some awesome perks and you'll help support this show. Today's episode is sponsored by Ritual. Do you have a perfect diet every day? Uh, nope. That's why lots of us take a multivitamin to fill in the gaps in our diet. So I did a lot of research to find this company, Ritual. They make a multivitamin that's different. Okay, so what do you like about it? Well, first of all, Ritual is committed to making their products as sustainable as possible. Mm, like how? Well, first off, their bottle. It's made with 100% recycled materials. Even the mailers that they send out are made from recycled newsprint and plant fibers. They even use plant-based ink. Okay, that's cool, but what about inside the bottle? All right, how about the fact that the omega-3s I get from Ritual's 10 nutrient multivitamin come from vegan algal oil instead of fish oil? That saves 273 anchovies per bottle. Oh, right, because fish get their omega-3s from eating algae, and Ritual just saved a step. I mean, why kill fish when you can go straight to the algae for omega-3s? Ritual is vegan-friendly, sugar-free, non-GMO, gluten-free, and allergen-free. And you know what I like? Uh, that they're delivered to your door for only a dollar a day. That and the fact that they're delayed release, so it's easy for your stomach. And there's a mint tab in every bottle to keep your vitamins smelling fresh. Fill in the gaps in your diet with Ritual. Ritual is offering 10% off your first three months by going to ritual.com slash NYK10 and use code NYK10 at checkout. And we're brought to you by BigBattery.com. No matter what you need to power, Big Battery can provide you with the latest battery tech at the best price per kilowatt hour guaranteed. Their batteries are easily installed, require zero maintenance, and they're made right here in the U.S. Pick up yours today at BigBattery.com and use the code now you know for 5% off at checkout. Kathy Wood, the head of ARK Invest and someone we highly respect, just updated ARK's valuation of Tesla, one of their biggest holdings. Kathy Wood gave the updated Tesla stock price target last week during an interview with Yahoo Finance, saying, Our estimate for Tesla's success has gone up. The main reason for that is their market share. Instead of going down from year-end 2017 to today, it has actually gone up fairly dramatically. ARK now sets a $3,000 price per share target for Tesla for 2025. That would place Tesla market cap at about $3 trillion and possibly make it the most valuable company in the world. Kathy Wood said they believe Tesla will be delivering between 5 and 10 million vehicles as soon as 2025 and that Tesla will have a completely autonomous ride hailing network, the Tesla network, with high margins. And Elon agrees with her. As reported in Electrek, in an email to employees, Elon is reported as saying, if we execute really well, I agree with ARK Invest. Now, you may be asking, why is Elon so bullish on Tesla stock price and why is he telling employees about his predictions now? Well, we'll be covering this on our Now You Know Investor Club bonus story this week. You're not going to want to miss it. So if you want to check that out, you can head over to patreon.com slash now you know. When you join our investor club, you get access to our Slack of over 1,700 members where we're all talking about uh, sustainable and disruptive investments. You also get access to our investor club bonus stories and you get access to our monthly live streams where you can actually talk to the CEO of a company and ask them questions. So Aaron asked a question that's been on everyone's mind, I think. Can we have an update on the Roadster now that Plaid with Trimotors is out? Elon said 2021 has been a year of super crazy supply chain shortages, so it wouldn't matter if we had 17 new products as none would ship. Assuming 2022 is not mega drama, new Roadster should ship in 2023. Hang on. Mm -hmm. I thought we were getting Roadsters next year. Well, apparently, that's going to be pushed uh, to 2023. And that's an if. I mean, he said, assuming no mega drama, what if we have more supply chain issues or something? Then... Yep, it would be pushed further, it sounds like. Just remember, 2017, we went to the Tesla Semi unveiling, which then unveiled the Roadster. And we were told, I think, what, 2020 for the Roadster. So this is uh, it's, some serious pushback here. Sure. 2023 now? Uh, I mean, it's not a critical vehicle for Tesla. It's critical for me. It's critical for I you. I want to but... do the world tour and get you guys in the Roadster. Yeah, but it uh, looks like that's going to have to be delayed. Sorry, <sighs> at least it's not our fault. So according to Electrek, Elon had a company-wide call with employees last week, and on that call, he discussed a delay in bringing Cybertruck to production. 
Elon told employees that because there is so much new technology going into the Cybertruck, he doesn't expect production to start until late 2022. And he doesn't expect volume production until late 2023. Wait a minute. Roadster production, not till 2023. Cybertruck, not till 2023. Well, I mean, some people might be getting their cars in 2022. So I maybe. Know, hopefully. Elon is quoted as saying during the call, it will be a special project like a glitch in the Matrix, like if Neo had a car. Now, we had been expecting limited production to start at the end of this year, according to what we'd heard on previous earnings calls. But alas, this makes sense. I mean, I think we all kind of knew that Giga Texas first needs to finish construction of the factory, then focus on the Model Y, and then it can focus on Cybertruck. Yeah, there are just so many new parts and processes going into the Cybertruck that it was hard to believe that we were going to see any this year. So I'm still going to hold out hope that you and I with our super low reservation number might see the Cybertruck at the end of next year. But it doesn't look as likely anymore. Mm. On that same company-wide call, Elon is reported in Electrek as saying a little something about their next vehicle, the $25,000 model that many are dubbing the Model 2. Elon reportedly told employees on the call that Tesla will begin production of the new low-priced model in 2023. So it's a very exciting year. I know. That could be a huge year. And then he asked employees, do you want to have this car come with the steering wheel and pedals? This has started a bunch of speculation over whether this car will be a fully autonomous car and whether it will just be made for Tesla's autonomous ride hailing network. I mean, what if? Conjecture alert. Conjecture time. What if this car will not be sold for $25,000? What if it will just go on the Tesla network? I don't know. Comment down below what you think. I mean, I'm just saying, first, we heard rumors of it coming out next year. And I thought, well, OK, that means it's going to be a regular electric car that is meant to grab market share at the lower end. But now it's not even starting production till 2023. Is that Tesla's buying time for full autonomy to catch hold? I mean, comment below. Let us know what you think. But I kind of think maybe in Elon's mind, at least he's thinking this car will come out and just do our Tesla network. And then what does that mean about the Cybertruck if they have full autonomy by 2023? Right. Now, a lot of people were calling this the Model 2 during the call. He said it's not going to be called the Model 2. I mean, he called the Model 3 the Model 3 because it was supposed to be the Model E and he couldn't get the Model E from Ford. So he made it the Model 3 as a joke. So I don't think it'll be called the Model 2. Also comment down below what you think it's going to be called. And a lot of people have also been saying, wait a minute, a $25,000 car, but with full self-driving, that would make it a $35,000 mm -hmm. car. And that's kind of why I think it'll be a car just for the Tesla network. It will come out as a $25,000 car that no one really buys because Tesla will own them. And then Tesla will just turn on its full self-driving for itself. Interesting. But then why would it be called a $25,000 car? Because they're not selling it at retail prices. Well, what was the whole point of the $25,000 car? It was to get the masses into an electric car. Who cares whether they buy it or whether they go on the Tesla network? I mean, technology is changing. If Elon can make this work in time, and I'm not saying I'm sure of it, but if he can, why bother selling you the car? And we've talked about this before in in-depth, that I don't think Elon really wants to sell you cars much longer. So we've just published a new video to our Disruptive Investing channel with the president of Green Power Motors, Brendan Riley. Now, as you may know, Green Power Motors is a Canadian-based company making electric trucks and buses. So go check that out and subscribe to the Disruptive Investing channel and hit the notification button so that you can get notified when new videos go up. Because to make money in this economy, you need to know who is doing the disrupting and who is getting disrupted. And speaking of making money, Brendan will be joining us on our Investor Club live stream in a couple weeks. We haven't confirmed the date yet, but it should be really fun. Again, talking to the CEOs and presidents of companies and you getting to ask questions is pretty cool. So go join our Now You Know Investor Club on Patreon and be a part of that. So Elon tweeted out, full self-driving beta 10 rolls out midnight Friday next week. So, I mean, he tweeted that out on the first. So does that mean it's coming out this Friday? Yeah, September 10th. Uh, Elon went on to say, looks promising that beta 10.1 about two weeks later will be good enough for public opt-in request button. So that would put the magical, the magical button, button on, on September, September 24th, 24th ish. ish. Early Christmas present. Toby Lee tweeted, do you have any updates on approval of full self-driving beta for Canadian users? Elon said, not sure, but maybe in a few months. In general, for any region, we need to make software work well, test it extensively, and then get regulatory approval. If we could go faster while being safe, we would. Ivan asked, 10.1 expansion to all of early access, please. Elon said, that is the aspiration, but we need to be cautious. Safety is always paramount at Tesla. Then Pernay asked, which build have you been running slash testing in your car? Elon said, I mostly run alpha software in my car, which is not meant for public consumption. A few days before release, I switch my car to what public will experience. Tesla owners of Silicon Valley said full self-driving beta handled Yosemite like a champ. It's crazy how well it does on these roads. Only one disengagement. 
Elon said, and beta 10 is a step change improvement from what you have. So this is exciting. And it's kind of what we've been thinking all along uh, on his timeline. He hasn't really pushed back on this timeline yet. It has been exactly two weeks, exactly like what he said. Okay, that's fair. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Shouldn't count our chickens till they hatch. I mean, you're, you're wearing the shirt. That's true. Now, I know that we still don't have access to the full self-driving beta button, um, but if you would like to hit a button, the like button is a great button to hit. It really helps out the show. It, like, does something with the the creepy YouTube algorithm to let more people see this video, and you have to do it because we have to tell you to do it. It's it's a bad thing about YouTube, but if you do it, good Please. All right, so we get a little bit of Professor Musk here on batteries. Uh, the limiting factor tweeted out, the debate about battery cell form factor is dumb. Tell me the pack level performance and economics. The ideal form factor varies with chemistry, use case, and pack design. Elon said, generally agree, but probability of thermal runaway is dangerously high with large pouch cells. Tesla strongly recommends against their use. So large pouch cells is kind of what most of the competition uses. You'll find them in, you know, like the Chevy Bolt. Tesla Fax said, so smaller reinforced pressure protected prismatic cells for iron based cells, LFP, are good and safe. And steel cylindrical for nickel and iron are the overall design sweet spot. Elon said, yes, physics of large cells means distance from cooling loop to center of cell is high, so harder to prevent hot spots. Then pressure and heat released from large cell in weak bag make it impossible to stop whole pack from burning. Pretty basic. He went on to say, our new cell is 46 millimeter diameter with steel shell, and even that was a huge challenge for propagation resistance, meaning uh, spreading a fire. Long Elon said, will Tesla eventually make its own LFP cells in addition to the nickel-based 4680s? Then Elon said this tweet, which I don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. He said, iron, the last element made in a star, appears likely to exceed nickel by three to one or more. Does that mean they're going to make more iron-based cells? Or does that mean that there's more iron in the world, which we know there is? Like, I don't know what he's saying. I feel like he's saying that there will be more cars with iron-based cells than nickel-based cells, um, which, I mean, if we're thinking of, like, their master plan and what they talked about at Battery Day, then that seems to check out. And that does seem to be true from Elon's next tweet. There are vast amounts of iron and lithium on Earth, but much less nickel. For global industry to scale battery production to about 10 terawatt hours a year, it needs to be mostly iron. Higher energy density of nickel only needed for very long range vehicles and aircraft. Hmm. And then Viv asked my question, uh, how many miles of range would be considered very long range? Or rather, what's the tipping point for range where it makes sense to switch to nickel versus iron for standard and medium range vehicles? Elon said, this is obviously debatable, but I'd call anything with around 300 miles or 500 kilometers of true usable travel distance, long range, beyond that, very long range. Okay, so we're basically getting a snapshot of what's going to happen. We're going to see LFP batteries going into things like Model 2s. And and I would even think uh, lower ranged Model 3s, mm-hmm. um, maybe the standard range plus. I mean, I know that a lot of people, as we talked about last week, were getting emails saying, hey... Would you like an LFP uh, battery? And our Patreon poll from last week showed that most people weren't that opposed to an iron-based cell. Right, there are some advantages. So, mm-hmm. I mean, this is going to help out a lot because nickel was a limiting factor. And it's expensive. Yeah. Uh, and iron is a lot cheaper. And you need nickel so you can make stainless steel so you can make starships. All right, so in Tesla's latest over-the-air update, they wrote in the release notes, the cabin camera above your rear view mirror can now determine driver inattentiveness and provide you with audible alerts to remind you to keep your eyes on the road when autopilot is engaged. Camera images do not leave the vehicle itself, which means the system cannot save or transmit information unless you enable data sharing. So wait, uh, what's changed? Uh, Basically, they've turned on the camera. We had been seeing some of this in the full self-driving beta. Now it looks like they've rolled it out to public releases where the camera that's looking at you in your car is going to see if you're not paying any attention. But it doesn't sound like it's going to disengage autopilot. It's just going to give you an audible warning, almost like this is the first step. I think that what it's going to do is give you that warning to like put your hands on the steering wheel so it'll begin the disengagement process. Like it, it definitely won't just kick you out. That would be unsafe. Um, but by giving you the audible warning and probably the on-screen warning as well, I think that it's going to have you, you know, put down your phone and uh, pay attention to the road again. As soon as we get this update, we should go test it. Absolutely. All right. It's time for a Rivian update. Where's, Where's our, our Rivian? Rivian? Well, well, I don't know that, but we do have a couple new bits of information from Rivian. Great. 
First, Rivian released their EPA range rating for the R1T and the R1S with the large pack. The R1T will have 314 miles of EPA rated range and the R1S will have 316 miles of range. What I think is even more important is now we know the MPGE or basically the efficiency of both vehicles. The R1T has an MPGE of 70 and the R1S has an MPGE of 69. Yes, this will allow us to compare the R1T to other pickup trucks like the Cybertruck and the Ford F-150 Lightning when they get closer to production. So just to give us some perspective, the 2019 Model X has a combined city highway MPGE of 87. It uses 37 kilowatt hours to go 100 miles. Doing some back of the napkin math, this means that the R1T large pack is probably a 139 kilowatt hour pack. Wow, that's yeah. humongous. I kind of thought it was going to be like 100 or 110 kilowatt hours. But I mean, I could be wrong, but that's the math I got. That I mean, that is a lot of batteries. Yeah, and that's pretty inefficient. And it makes sense. I mean, it's not as aerodynamic as a Model X. Rivian is also going to offer a max pack for an additional $10,000, which they say will give 400 plus miles of range. Also, RJ tweeted out the R1T doing some water waiting. Yeah, he said our engineer is going for a quick dip. And this is pretty impressive. I mean, that's over three feet of water that would have drowned most ice vehicles. But I mean, why are they testing this now? Like, shouldn't this have been done like a year ago? Well, I think that this test might not have happened recently or... They just recreated it for publicity's sake. I think that when the delays started to stack up and they said, oh, boy, we're going to have to push the release of the vehicle, um, their PR department went, hey, RJ, uh, we've developed a little schedule for you um, of things that you should tweet out um, to keep everyone enticed and interested in the R1T. So that way it it obfuscates from the story of, hey, where is my truck? And instead it's like, ooh, it's going through a big puddle. Take your oh. eye off the delay. <laughs> What's that over there? And I mean, I, I think any company would do that. Um, any company uh, with a PR department. Huh. Oh. Tesla Time News is sponsored by Cybertruck Owners Club. There you'll find a crowdsource reservation tracker that you can update and find your place in line. Check out their website for Cybertruck news, discussions, and community for Cybertruck enthusiasts and future owners. All right, our buddy Brian has just shot an update about the Well Done Foundation. Take it away, Brian. Hi, Zach and Jesse. Brian Reby reporting from Shelby, Montana. And I'm touching base again with the Well Done Foundation. Curtis was out of town and we couldn't make the schedules work, but I'll catch up with him via Zoom. I caught up with Stacy in the Visitor Center and she told me about their progress. As of today, we are starting our eighth well, plugging. Goal for this year is 30 wells here out in Shelby. And so far, it's on track. When we set this up, you were saying you just finished number 10? Uh, we just got the bottom plug at number 10 uh, yesterday. And so we'll go back and tag on that day. We are expanding in Louisiana, Kansas, Pennsylvania. We're hoping to start plugging in Pennsylvania and Louisiana in probably late September, early October. But it's important for us to you know to get in. It's important for the community. It's important for the regulatory agencies that Well Done Foundation gets in and starts, you know, cracking. And that's been our, you know, our MO all along, as it were an action based organization. We've been doing field trips for third graders, teaching them about the wells, and we have a hands-on demonstration that we have the children do, and it shows the different layers with the sand and the cement, and this represents the actual well bore. I have a, a goal between now and the end of the year to get uh, a thousand wells uh, teed up for starting execution in 2022. And that's across all of the states that we're working in. If from anywhere, from a phone, laptop, desktop, we can pull up the wells that we're, that we're monitoring and see what they're doing, right? See what's happening. And also so far, the wells that we have closed, we monitor them. And so there's been zero emissions on all of those, which is really exciting. 
doing good work, communicating that good work, keeping the stoke alive, if you would, with all those people who are following the project and being a part of this cool effort. And communicate to Zach and Jesse for us. So we appreciate everything that those guys are doing. The plan is working and wells are being capped. I'm here to prove that it's actually happening and great to see it with my own eyes and bring it to your audience. And speaking of your audience, a lot of this is possible because of the contributions from the Now You Know audience, but also from the sales of the EcoWare t-shirts, that a portion of that goes to helping cap a well. So really exciting that the Now You Know audience is helping get these methane emissions out of here and making the world a better, cleaner place. Speaking of cleaner, my car's getting cleaner, I'm getting cleaner, it's raining, I'm out of here. But have a great day, and now you know. Thanks, Brian. Great update on the Well Done Foundation's amazing work, not just capping wells, which is so important, but also educating kids. You can catch Brian's full interview and learn more by heading over to Brian's YouTube channel. We'll put links in the show notes below. And Brian is right. When you shop at EcoWare for everything from tees to hoodies, mugs to hats, and so much more, we plant 10 trees for every purchase and help cap wells with our partnership with the Well Done Foundation. So check out our new designs that go up almost every week, including two weeks which is ready now not in two weeks it's ready now <laughs> and also uh all of spacex's rockets. to scale well not i mean to relative scale. relative scale <laughs> that'd be a that'd big, be a big shirt. shirt all right so you know we have a now let's review channel where we review all sorts of e-mobility devices e-bikes and e-scooters you guys just reviewed the aerial rideal e-bike um, and if you're in the market for a new e-bike you're not going to want to miss this review yeah, the Rideal is a sub $1,000 e-bike that fits a lot of budgets. Ethan and I give you the rundown on how this bike performs in terms of range, comfort, braking, and accessories. And we just finished outfitting our new Now Let's Review shop, uh, which is our new set, which I think came out great. So you should go check that out um, and subscribe to that channel too, because if you want the latest on all the new e-mobility devices coming out, like we're getting the new Sondor's Metacycle, mm -hmm. you're not gonna wanna miss that. Well, it's September and you know what that means. Back to school. No, it's constant. Concept season. Ooh. Ah. Yes. Yeah, the Munich Auto Show is this month, and we must check out all the new concepts. Ooh, do we have to? Yeah, you must keep up with all the latest trends. But they aren't even going to make half of these cars. Mm, shut up, Zach. Zessie, take it away. First up is the Cupra Urban Rebel concept. It should have a zero to 60 of 3.2 seconds. And it looks like this. Um, because Cupra is a VW company, many are speculating that this will be the approximate size of the yet to be released VW ID2. So this is a souped up looking version of the Cupra, which will be launched in 2025. Yes, for a 20 to 25,000 euro price tag, apparently. But I mean, you're gonna have to wait till 2025 to get it. I mean, looks really cool. Um, but that's because it's the concept version, which we might not be able to buy. Also at the auto show was the Mercedes EQB, EQE, EQG, and the Mercedes Maybach SUV. Wow. So lots of different uh, cars that talk about. Some are coming out. Some are still concepts. And that's not all that's going to be at the auto show. Do we have to do another concept? Yes, apparently we do. Fine. Audi unveiled its Grand Sphere concept car ahead of the International Auto Show in Munich. Audi said the Audi Grand Sphere has a special place. That is because the technologies and design features assembled in it will turn up again within a few years in future Audi series. Audi claims the concept is built around autonomy and describes it as a private jet or first class for the road. Oh, look, a stupid grill and suicide doors with no B pillar. And is that a plant inside? I think it is. Audi says the Grand Sphere has a 120 kilowatt hour battery. Wow. Uses 800 volt architecture with 466 miles or 750 kilometers of range and 25 minutes to charge from 5 to 80 percent. But of course, this doesn't mean anything because they aren't making this. <laughs> it is a concept so they can use whatever numbers they want. Can we please cover a car that's actually going to be coming out soon? Uh, sure. There's the Subaru Solterra. Subaru says, our most technologically advanced Subaru yet. Solterra is quiet, spacious, and comfortably equipped with all the cabin technology you need for a modern SUV. The all-wheel drive SUV is scheduled to go on sale in late 2022. Now, the only problem is we don't get a clear picture of what it's going to look like. So yeah, they got some just... water on the lens there. Yeah, can like. we just take it and just... 
Oh, and then just oh, zoom in there. That's what it'll look like. Why do they do this? Why do they obfuscate with, with the car? Are they just because they're not finished designing it? Because you have to. <laughs> Ooh. Is this going for just like loyal Subaru buyers? Is that what this is? I don't know what we're doing this for. But I think this is actually, even though it's a concept car, probably a big news because you were talking about the Super earlier being maybe their next ID2. I think this is is VW's sub $25,000 car. VW unveiled its new ID concept car at IAA Mobility, the ID Life. So did they get the cost down by making it out of like plastic? It looks kind of weird. Well, yeah, in fact they did. VW says it's made out of recycled plastic. CEO of the VW brand, Ralph Brandstetter said, the ID Life is our vision of the next generation fully electric urban mobility. The concept car provides a preview of an ID model in the small car segment that we will be launching in 2025, priced at around 20,000 euros. And how about the interior? It looks like... Uh... Looks like they used the Model 3 and refreshed Model S for the inspiration boards. Um, but wait, there's no there's no screen? Yeah, I was confused by that too. Uh, is it just the driver's phone mounted to the dash or is that just like a tiny, tiny screen? <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, how about the specs? Yeah, VW says it'll have a 172 kilowatt motor with front wheel drive, zero to 60 acceleration in 6.9 seconds, which mm -hmm. isn't bad actually, mm -hmm. and a 57 kilowatt hour battery pack for a WLTP range, which isn't real, mm -hmm. of 400 kilometers, which is probably more like EPA range of 200 miles. Okay. I mean, I think that would be decent for the price, but now what? what is this? Is this a 50 inch monitor? Uh, they say the vehicle comes with a video game console and projector as well as a projection screen that extends from the dash panel when required. Uh, can you say copy Tesla again? Huh? VW says they'll be launching the $24,000 ID Life in 2025. So that'll be two years after the Model 2 comes out. And again, they'll be too late to the party. Maybe it'll be only one year after the Model 2 if the Model 2 gets pushed a year back, which they're launching it in 2025 launching it not right. volume production right. my friend yeah well you know it'll be it'll be in four years you don't know what the world's gonna look like <laughs> no i time. don't i do not another chevy bolt caught on fire this week as it was parked outside at night while not charging this is the 20th chevy bolt that we know of to spontaneously combust putting the percentage of fires at just 0.014 percent of all bolts Compare that to 0.07% of all gas and diesel cars catching on fire, according to the NFPA, meaning gas and diesel cars still catch on fire five times more often than a Chevy Bolt. Although most of those ice fires aren't spontaneous, right? They usually involve a crash or something like that. Um, as we've previously reported, this fire situation has caused GM to launch a $2 billion recall to fix faulty battery cells made by LG Chem, which includes every single bolt that has ever been made. GM already halted production of the bolt due to chip shortages last month, but now GM spokesman Daniel Flores says in a statement to The Verge, we will not resume repairs or restart production until we are confident LG is producing defect-free products for us. So what does that mean? Well, it sounds like GM is definitely going after LG to cover their recall costs. But I mean, the whole recall is to repair these cars that have problems, does this mean that they're not going to do anything with the Chevy Bolts that currently might, you know, small chance that they might just spontaneously combust until right. LG does something about it? Right, exactly. Right now, if you own a Chevy Bolt, what are you supposed to do with it? It's like a fire hazard. It's like something that's about to, it could blow up for any reason. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's not so much that it's like likely to happen. It's very unlikely to happen, but there's nothing, it's not like, oh, it's because you drove it too fast or but something. Ha but hang on, I feel like uh, this problem could get exponentially worse as time goes on because mm -hmm. we all know that problems like this in battery batteries uh, don't get better over time, they get worse. So, right. I mean, I'm not saying that every bolt will catch on fire, but it's it's like this unknown thing in your driveway that you're like, what do I, what do, I do? Like kids, stay away from it. Right. I think that what GM is doing with LG is they're 
ratcheting up the pressure and the tension. I mean, right now, GM has said that this problem won't affect their Ultium partnership. Yeah, because keep in mind, LG is partnering with them to make the Ultium batteries. You know, to go in their Lyric and to go into the Hummer and probably whatever their other pickup truck is going to be. But I'm thinking basically behind closed doors, they're saying, listen, LG, you need to give us $2 billion because you messed up the production of these batteries. And if if you don't do that, we're going to go find someone else for the partnership. Yeah, but, but who has the upper hand here? Because, mm-hmm. I mean, you might say GM, they're a huge company. But, I mean, LG is, I think, in the driver's seat here because every car company needs batteries and there's not that many battery companies. And if GM is going to go like, well, we're not going to work with you, LG. We're going to work with, um, who else can we work with? <laughs> I mean, right. yeah, they, they could call up Panasonic or Cattle, but... Uh, both of those companies have tons of battery contracts. Yeah. They're going to go like, oh, who are you? GM? Yeah, we'll yeah, get, we'll get to you at some point. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to you at some point. Meanwhile, uh, GM won't have any batteries for their upcoming cars. And then what will happen? This is a really sticky situation for GM. I don't know how they're going to get out of it. Right. And I mean, I do want to put the blame where the blame is due. LG did mess up the production of these cells, but GM did put out the car with the batteries in them. Right. So I don't know. Mm. Not great. And if you'd like to see these stories as short bite-sized clips that you can share with your friends, uh, head on over to our Now You Know Clips channel where we chop them up into easy to share clips. All right, it would normally be the Starman report, but Eli is just getting back from vacation, so he'll be uh, giving us his new report next week. It's time for Into the Future. Now, KiwiBot is a last mile robot delivery company founded in Colombia that makes these cute little semi-autonomous food delivery robots. Semi-autonomous? Well, they have LiDAR and a camera and they can see and navigate around by themselves pretty well. But human supervisors in Colombia can remotely control up to 10 bots and help with path planning and getting them out of sticky situations. So why are we reporting on them? Well, KiwiBot has been testing in San Jose, UC Berkeley, Miami, Pittsburgh, and Detroit. But now KiwiBot announced its official expansion into these cities. People are going to start seeing these deliver their food soon. So how do they work? KiwiBots open the inner container door without human help, and then restaurants put food deliveries inside. Then KiwiBot closes and locks the door, and off it goes to deliver the food. It can go for 10 hours and travel 12 miles within those 10 hours. Okay, that sounds pretty slow. We're talking like three miles an hour or like walking speed. Why so slow? Well, I'm guessing it's number one to help with adoption. I mean, they probably know that robots traveling faster than that are going to scare people, whereas slow and cute is like a puppy factor. Okay, and the second reason? Well, battery life. I mean, faster means less range. So for now, I think deliveries are on a like campus scale within a short distance between the restaurant and your home or dorm. So all jokes about cute robots aside, let's talk about the benefits. These are electric, so no pollution. The cost is $3.99 per delivery, and each restaurant can decide whether that cost is borne by the customer or the restaurant. So that's cheaper in most cases than a human can do it. I would love for our viewers to send us videos of these little guys in action if they see them. Yeah, and I'd especially love to hear from restaurants that use KiwiBots to deliver? I mean, are they reliable? Are they cost effective? In essence, do they work as advertised? All right, it's time for Going Green. Brought to you by EcoWare. And this week, um, I want to be talking about one of our very own viewers of this show. He's probably watching it right now. Our buddy Bill at Rocking KB Ranch in Wisconsin. I don't think he is watching right now. Why? I think he's busy making honey. Well, he's not making the honey. The bees are making the honey. And if you'd like to get some of this all-natural honey, you can get it over at EcoWare. It's not the only thing you get in EcoWare, of course. Yeah, right. We've got everything from mugs to flip-flops to shower curtains. And remember that at EcoWare, we carbon offset the manufacturing, the shipping, and the life cycle of your purchase. And we plant 10 trees for every purchase. And we help cap a well with the Well Done Foundation. Nissan and Waseda University in Tokyo have started testing a recycling process to recycle electric motors. Oh, right, because those motors have neodymium. Isn't that a rare earth metal? Well, let's talk about that. The term rare earth elements came about in the mid 1800s when the only people to stumble upon them were people like Carl Gustav Mosander and Martin Klaproth. They were rare to chemists at the time, 
but rare earth elements actually show up in the Earth's crust in similar concentrations to many common metals. Neodymium, for example, is about as common as copper. Oh. So it's not as abundant as, say, iron, but nowhere near as rare as, say, gold. However, because it's called a rare earth metal, many journalists and others get the idea that it's like unobtainium. Now, it is a limited resource, the same as any other, and it is good to recycle it. Um, but we're not about to go to war with China over neodymium anytime soon. Rant over. All right, so Nissan can recycle neodymium now? Yes, by melting down the magnets and doing some chemistry, they can get back to high purity elements to make brand new magnets without having to worry about the fiddly business of taking stuff apart. Okay, so it's cheaper to chuck the whole motor into a smelter, melt it down, then try and take the very powerful magnets out by hand? I mean, we don't really get to play around with magnets that are this strong most of the time. It's in your car, and when you go, whoa, in your Tesla, it's those magnets that are pulling you. Keep that in mind. So they're very, very powerful. If you wanted to try and just like take one off, it would take a lot of force. You could break it. It could then you'd have a bunch of magnetic chunks flying around much oh. easier. Chuck that in a smelter. Well, and plus, it's probably the wrong shape and size for what you need it for next. Right. You'd have to demagnetize it, do a whole bunch of other steps. It's a oh, lot wait, easier. So it doesn't come out of the earth as a magnet? No, you actually uh, take a bunch of materials, including neodymium and iron and stuff. It, you melt it all down. You grind it up into a powder. You mix it. You center it together. Then you magnetize it. Oh, so it's not I, like... I just thought you dug it up and it was already a great magnet. No. I oh, mean, that's interesting. I, I mean, there's these stories of like the Greek guy who discovered magnets because he was like standing on a magnetic rock and his sandals were like sticking to it because the nails in there. And he's like, whoa, what is this? You can find magnets in nature. But we don't use them like right out of the ground, put them into a motor. No, we, we make the magnets. Oh. It's, we can do that. Good to know. All right, it's time for Sunspots. XL Fleet, which electrifies Class 2 to Class 6 trucks, has just partnered with eNow to integrate lithium-ion batteries into the floors of refrigerated Class 8 trucks, along with solar panels on the roof, to power the refrigerators for up to 12 hours a day without charging. Normally, trucks would have to keep their diesel engines on constantly, even when the trucks are idling during loading or at the store to unload, just to keep the refrigerators running. That averages 3.7 liters, or about a gallon per hour of diesel fuel burned, and 22 liters of CO2 per hour going into the atmosphere. Now, with this solution, at least the refrigeration part can be cleaned up. Yeah, so not a perfect solution. Doesn't mean the whole truck is clean, but at least that part of it can be clean now. And as soon as we get, you know, uh, Tesla semi trucks, when the whole thing's electric, it's all going to be clean. And you could probably get rid of the batteries in the floor of the thing and just have the solar panels on top because you could rely on the giant traction battery of the Tesla Semi to, you know, cool off the interior of your refrigerated cab. Exactly. And if you'd like to get solar panels on the roof of your house, not your truck, uh, then call our friends at Energy Pal because they are the energy experts that know everything about batteries and solar, and they can walk you through all the latest tax changes and all the things that you need to know, and it's free. So reach out to them down below in the link and tell them that Zach and Jesse sent you. All right, it's time for our video contributor stories. Who do we got this week? We've got Alex in Russia with an update on electric buses and his personal e-mobility device. Hello, Zach and Jesse. It's Alex here from Moscow, Russia. I wanted to tell you and your viewers two great things regarding electric transportation in Russia. The first is that we have electric buses in some cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg. Currently, we have only just a bit more than 400 of them in Moscow, for example, while there are more than 6,000 ICE buses. But the number is slowly growing over time. They are made in Russia and look pretty nice and solid. Currently, two different models are present here, uh, both with LTO, lithium titanate batteries, which can handle rapid charging and low temperatures better, while inferior in other ways. Uh, and these batteries are surprisingly small for a bus, less than 100 kilowatt hours. That is really low, <laughs> less than in Tesla, meaning low range, but it is compensated by rapid charging at the end of the route. It takes approximately 20 minutes to 80% of the charge, which is enough to get to the next end. Uh, St. Petersburg took a different approach, utilizing full electric hybrids. Yeah, sounds funny, I know. The point is, it can act both as an electric bus and as a trolley bus, making it much more efficient as it doesn't need any time to recharge at the station. The second thing I wanted to tell you about is a type of personal electric transport, which is used here and you may actually be interested in. 
Scooters. While you were talking about scooters, bikes, even skateboards, all can be electric. I couldn't find anything about monowheels. Well, except for the weird one. I own one, and as it's not an advertisement, I won't tell you the manufacturer and the exact model. But it is a very interesting device. Mine has maximum speed uh, of 30 km per hour. It's approximately uh, 18 and a half miles per, per hour, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and 86 kilometers of range, 53 miles, on a single charge, yeah. Well, at least spec says 86 kilometers, so it's probably a bit less, but still pretty much. Here's a handle to move it around. You can have slopes to get it anywhere in town. You can carry it with you in a train or a bus, and it is even capable of some off-roading. Now you know. Yeah, the reason we haven't reviewed this type of one wheel is that they are so hard to ride, but you've inspired us, Alex. We'll have to see about reviewing some of them. I'll bet Ethan is up to the challenge. All right, it's time for our Patreon bonus stories. And first up, we've got an Investor Club bonus story you're not going to want to miss, along with uh, a Tesla crash in Florida, the Plaid doing some runs at Nürburgring, uh, I have a rant on autopilot, and we're going to see the new BMW concept electric motorcycle, along with some other great news. So if you want to help support the show, head over to patreon.com slash now you know for just as little as a buck a month, you get access to the Patreon bonus stories. If you want to check out our Investor Club bonus stories, it's $10 a month. There's also lots of other great perks. You can get your name at the end of the show. Go check it out at patreon.com slash now you know. All right, we're back from the Patreon bonus stories. It's time for the shout outs. These are people that support us for $5 or more a month and they get their names in the end credits at the end of the show. Who do we have, Jess? Joe Booth. Andrew Tarrant. Craig Hill. Joe M. Eric Rice. Dustin Donjis. Harlequin. Tyler. Brian Carmichael. John Harcum. Jose De Fritas. Joe Hendrickson. Sylvian Drowen. Matt Protola. Joel Martinez. Calvin Fetty. Stephen Eastman. Mome Jacobs. Ernest A. Cataldo. Hey, it's my grandfather. <laughs> Daniel Brandborg. Marie and Antoine Kyle. Adam Manier. Arthur Bowman. And Yomi Alibi. Thank you so much for supporting us. We can't do this show without you. All right, it's time for Elon's tweets of the week, and there's a lot of them. Sam said, Elon, I've often wondered why Sentry Mode can't turn itself back on automatically after a software update. Having to switch it off creates a security vulnerability. Any chance of fixing that? Thanks. I thought it already did this. I thought it already turned Sentry Mode back on. Well, Elon said, okay. Okay, well, great, I guess. Uh, Elon tweeted out, flying over Starbase. And uh, this video here, I think, is him videotaping the flying. I don't know if he's flying the jet. Eva says she caught him. Does that mean that he was, in fact, in that jet? I know that Elon flies jets. I don't know if he was flying and videotaping at the same time. I don't know. Maybe he was on, auto maybe he was on autopilot. Reichlin said SpaceX Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy flight worthy boosters as of August 29th. And uh, take a look at this chart. You might want to pause it because there's so much cool information here about how many flights they've had, how many uh, crew members, where, how many landings. And Elon said, the rocket fleet grows. Doug Kuplin said, are you a d We're all d and so what? And he put out this very interesting article in The Observer. You should read it. And then Elon doffed his hat at him. Tesla Fax says, by the way, a small fact check on the article. I believe it was Grimes who gave little X his name. And Elon, as a good and loving father, supports his son's mom every which way, including taking flack for the child's name. Elon said, I added the Archangel 12 part and obviously have a fondness for the letter X. Sam said, Elon, just a quickie, how many people work for your companies worldwide now? Has it reached 100,000? Elon said, roughly 110,000. Wow. Wow. Uh, almost Sober Russian said, uh, Rogozin on the Starship, this is all for the Pentagon Special Forces to transfer specially trained people from one continent to another. This is not at all in order to open to mankind the ability to fly across the ocean in a matter of minutes. Elon said, stop projecting. <laughs> I, I mean... <laughs> I get you could move special forces around the world in 45 minutes. You can also. It seems helpful. Put tourists in there. You could. Holmar's catalog said, imagine that instead of dropping someone off at the airport, your car could drop them off for you. Here's Tesla's pre-release full self-driving beta 9.2 driving from San Francisco to SFO airport with one disengagement. Tesla remains hilariously undervalued. Elon said beta 10 coming soon. Jeff said, yo, Elon, when is Tesla opening more service centers in the Northeast U.S.? Wait time is three plus weeks for an appointment. Elon said, thanks for bringing this up. Tesla will expedite service center openings. Have you tried our mobile service that comes to you? Jeff said, I have. Mobile service is only able to fix specific issues, though. In my case, I had to replace my front upper control arm, which cannot be done by mobile service. Thank you for giving me some confidence in the future of Tesla service. Today's experience wasn't great. And you've had your upper control arm replaced. Yep. 
and I had to, you know, make an appointment and wait two weeks. And meanwhile, the whole time it's squeaking and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's going to get fixed. And it's, I don't know. It's not great. It, it could be better. Ali says Tesla has 79% of all EVs registered in the United States. Where is the competition? Thanks to Now You Know Channel. And Elon responded to us. He said this might be part of the problem. GM is warning owners not to charge their bolts in or near their homes overnight. Coffee Table Tesla said, Elon, is it worth the engineering time to make the proximity sensor chimes be directionally projected from corresponding speakers in the cabin and with volume relative to distance? Seems we could do better than chimes too. Elon said, good point. Agreed. Doesn't Lucid already have this? Uh, in what? car that you can buy alex says remember the burned x on the frozen lake the u.s secret service found that the owner michael gonzalez 32 tricked tesla's purchasing system he ordered cars and had them delivered but never allowed the final payment he then resold the vehicles to companies and individuals elon said sigh so yeah that was a weird story uh, he can get 10 years per count if he's found guilty Ooh. that's 50 years dude on set digital said dear elon when are you launching starlink services in india we and our existing customers waiting for wireless internet services Elon said, just figuring out the regulatory approval process. So uh, it's a little pressure on Indian government. Maybe yeah. you should uh, increase the pressure if you live in India. Elon tweeted out these cool pictures of the Falcon 9 going up and coming down. And also landing on a drone ship, landing in the dark through clouds. Check out this video. I mean, come on. That's what? some real science fiction stuff. And it just happened. It already ha it's, it's history now. Eric Berger says, as it presses its case against NASA in the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, Blue Origin has hired former Amazon consultants linked to the Jedi contracting process. Elon said he should consider spending some money on actual Lunar Lander hardware instead of shady lobbyists. Oh! Got him. Michael Sheet says, SpaceX responds to Amazon's request that the FCC dismiss the Starlink Gen 2 amendment, calling it a continuation of efforts by the Amazon family of companies to hinder competitors, and referencing Blue Origin's lawsuit against NASA. Elon said, filing legal actions against SpaceX is actually his full-time job. And I mean, basically, this is pointing out that Amazon uh, spent days and days doing things against SpaceX and no time at all working on its own projects. You should read that. Pause, pause the screen and read that. Ashley Vance said, at what point does Elon Musk have a Falcon Heavy hover over Bezos' house all day? Elon said, maybe zap him on the head with our space lasers. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> wow. Michael Sheets says, former Navy intelligence officer Lila Koastani on CNN, frankly, I would love it if SpaceX would just flood Afghanistan with Starlink so that there is a way for us to maintain communication with our Afghan partners. Elon responded to this. He said, our satellites launching in the next few months have inter-satellite laser links, so no local downlink needed, probably active in four to six months. Technically, data packets do not need to touch regular internet. Data can flow from user terminal to satellites to user terminal. Scott Manley said, is there any real difference between the lasers? Do they need more onboard processing for packet routing, or were they built with sufficient capacity prior to addition of laser interlinks? Elon said processing is not an issue. Laser links alleviate ground station constraints so data can go from, say, Sydney to London through space, which is about 40% faster speed of light than fiber and shorter path. Also, no need for ground stations everywhere. Arctic will have great bandwidth. Well, and to clarify, Michael Sheet says, how does transmitting into a country without local downlink work on the regulatory side? Elon said they can shake their fist at the sky. That is a huge tweet. That means that you don't need anything but a Starlink in a country to get the Internet. And what that means for countries, say, like Afghanistan or China, other. Yes. Other countries where the Internet might be limited. Um, all you would need is a very small dish um, and you could basically have the Internet anywhere. Michael Sheet says French astronaut Thomas Pesquet captured spectacular photos of SpaceX's Cargo Dragon capsule firing its Draco thrusters while docking autonomously with the ISS on Monday. Elon said great shots by Tom Astro. Max says, hey, I just saw this on German Autobahn A2 near Matterberg this morning. It's coming from Austria and it might be heading to Hamburg or Rotterdam port. Looks like part of a future transport vehicle for getting Starship to the launch pad. Any other ideas? Elon said our new crane. So <laughs> that's what it is. They like cranes yeah. at Starbase. While Germo said 71.9% of new car sales in Norway in August were electric vehicles. New record Model Y on top. 
Elon said Norway for the win. Kristen said, looking forward to new paint colors coming out of Giga Berlin Paint Shop. Elon said, I was in the Berlin Paint Shop talking to the team on my last visit. It's going to be great. But bear in mind that it takes a year for a new factory to reach volume production. Production is super hard, which is why I have great respect for those who do it. Then Elon uh, tweeted out, a smoking emoji for this little video of the Falcon 9. Imagine if you looked up in the sky and you didn't know there was a launch going on. Um, good advertisement for SpaceX, I guess. You go, oh, it's aliens. And someone goes, ah, no, shut up. It's SpaceX. Vitalik, uh, the creator of Ethereum, says doing a random Twitter experiment just on this day. Only the 268 people I follow can reply to this tweet. Feel free to ask things and I'll talk about anything crypto or non-crypto related. Elon asked, what is love? And Vitalik responded back, X A E A twelve don't hurt me. It's you know the. Zeff said, Elon, why would you warn us about AI and then make a robot? Elon said the robots are coming anyway, as Boston Dynamics videos clearly show. I will not be able to ensure that robots made by other companies are safe, but I can try my best to do so at Tesla. Optimus then said, "Hello, Elon, as my creator. Thank you." Elon said, "You're welcome. Please be nice to the humans." Elon then tweeted, "Time is the ultimate currency." Uh oh. Time to sell your Dogecoin. That's How not, do I buy this time stuff? That's not what he meant. Marcus Howe said, when listening to Elon speak, it is really like he is counting back from the end of his useful lifespan to now and estimating all the steps and deadlines needed to become multiplanetary. It is a race against the clock for him, for all of us. Elon said, yes. Wow. Wow. SLR said, Tesla and Elon silently updated the sound and adjustability with 32.5. You can now fully control the subwoofer independent of bass tuning. Love these kind of updates. Sounds even better today than on delivery. Elon said, a lot of good work happening at Tesla Sound, Kodak, and audio software in general. Aiming for maximum music dopamine in your brain. What? Just stop for a second. Imagine any other... See a car CEO tweeting that out. No, I can't. It would, and, it would get a it would get a really great you know driver article. Be like, uh, audio lovers and car lovers unite. Uh, the Herbert Dees tweets great thing about new cars that they're making. You know, like that would be a whole thing, and we don't get. I any just of it. want this in the Model Three and Y though. It's oh all, yeah, I think I mean, it's coming. Let's do it. Uh, Eric X said Starbase twenty twenty three. Elon said twenty twenty two. Oh yeah. Trung Fan said a 2013 Elon email to employees on why he wants to keep SpaceX private. Elon said a lot has happened in the past eight years. All right. So now we need the results of the poll. And we asked our patrons, will the Model 2 really have no steering wheel or pedals? And most people said the first ones coming out will have steering wheels. And uh, the next most popular answer was they'll all have steering wheels. Interesting. I mean, our patrons are usually right. So I don't know. I don't know. All right. It's time for community mail time. And uh, remember, if you want to send in your story, send them to hello at nowyouknowchannel.com. First up, our buddy Jeff is having that EV event on September 18th. You don't want to miss it. It's at the Herbert Candies on Route 20 in Shrewsbury on Saturday, September 18th from 1 to 5. We're going to be there. So you can come and say hello to us. And a lot of other cool stuff is going on. He's going to have a raffle. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of EVs that you can ride in. So come check it out. And Rick, the NDEW captain, wants to get the word out about their Drive the Future event on Saturday, September 25th in Ambler, Pennsylvania. Uh, Gary and Linda are going on a road trip. They're coming uh, all the way to Boston. Wow. You might be able to see them. Then they're going to go back through the Trans-Canadian Highway. Have a good trip in Sparky, by the way, their Model Y's name. Oh, wow. Uh, Roland got invited to attend the grand opening of a new Tesla showroom and service center in Santa Fe, New Mexico on September 9th. I thought New Mexico had blocked Tesla. This is on sovereign native land north of Santa Fe. Whoa. Yeah. Good, okay. good work around there. Good loophole. Okay. Uh, George sent us this photo of a teal Model Y he spotted while supercharging his Model 3 in Indianapolis. Because, nice. of course, you wanted different wanted colored the uh, colors. cars. So yeah. you're going to get them. Uh, Stefan sent us this pink Model 3 in Sweden. Jesse's favorite things, Legos and Teslas. Well, Robert spotted these at Legoland in California. Nice. Good. Sp two at the same. Wow. Twofer. That's a twofer. Good job. Uh, Nam sent us this photo of his sick golden Model Y in the greater Toronto area. Wow. That is really cool. Nice. Uh, Jason sent us this photo of a lowered Model 3. Three, he spotted in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> wow. That is very low. Kevin shared this green roadster he saw back in 2017 at the Energy Fair in Custer, Wisconsin. Uh, Mark sent us this photo of this silver metallic Tesla. And Sam from Brandenburg, Germany asks, is his wrapped Model 3 colorful enough for you, Jesse? <laughs> yes, that's good. All right. And be careful what you ask for. Uh, just to prove our point, uh, our buddy Fred sent us this collection of Teslas. Wow. That's 
Wow. Uh, right? Okay. okay. Wow. Now, there's more coming, but uh, we don't have time this week, so there'll be a lot more coming next week. Awesome. All right. It's time for most beautiful Tesla supercharger. And before we get to that, we are going to get to this beautiful supercharger through this tale from our buddy Chris. My family and I were traveling on a 3,000-mile, eight-state road trip to Yellowstone in our Model Y this past July. We love the vehicle, and we were doing great until... Our car suddenly wouldn't supercharge halfway through the trip while we were in Idaho. Suddenly, we were stranded and we're almost 2,000 miles from home. I called Tesla roadside assistance and they informed us there was a Tesla service center within reach in Boise, Idaho. We made it to the service center after using a local destination charger that was available. The Tesla service center was excellent. Service advisor Matt and service tech William and the rest of the team immediately got to work on the vehicle. They understood that this was a unique situation with a fully loaded car and our little girl with us on vacation far from from home. It was very kind. They gave us a loaner Model S to get us some lunch and help us try to de-stress. Before we were done with lunch, they texted us the good news that they had found the problem and used some creative problem solving to get us back on the road in only three hours time. They stated they had never seen this charging issue in over eight years of service, so it's not something other Teslas need to be worried about. I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to the Tesla service team at Boise, Idaho. Because of them, we were able to finish our family vacation to Yellowstone without any additional expense or schedule changes. Also, we we want to give a massive thank you to Kunal, who is a Tesla owner and the local club leader in Boise. He kindly offered us to charge at his house if we needed or give us a ride if we didn't make the stretch to the service center. I want Elon and the team at Tesla to hear about this because I know it has been a priority for them to improve the customer service experience, especially related to service. We love Tesla and we love the Tesla community. Again, thank you to the Tesla service team in Boise for bending over backwards to ensure our family vacation with our Tesla be the best customer experience it could possibly be. Wow. Yes. Uh, this is what it's all about. And thank you to, I mean, everyone who made that possible for him because it sucks when you have a problem, but you got to see this, a beautiful, ironic supercharger in Wells, Nevada. And that is our beautiful supercharger of the week. All right, let's get on to the new supercharger reviews. Hey, Second Jesse, this is Richard coming to you live from the Bumless supercharger in Norway. This is a 20 uh, stall V3 supercharger uh, and it has a Circle K over there and uh, some non-Tesla chargers as well, which came in handy as I'm visiting in this Jaguar I-Pace that I'm renting for the weekend. I usually drive a Renault Kangoo electric van, but it has terrible range, so I had to rent this to get up to Oslo from Christiansand in the south to visit some family. Uh, this supercharger has pretty much everything you need. Uh, bathrooms, coffee, free Wi-Fi, close to the highway. I'm giving it an 8 out of 10. Hope to visit in the Model Y in a few years. Just got to save up some money. Now you know. Bye. Good morning, Zach and Jesse. We're over here in beautiful St. Simons Island, off the coast of Georgia. And we just spent the night at this uh, Ethan Inn by Hilton Head. They've got an amazing four stalls of destination chargers and an additional two stalls of uh, Spark J1772 for a total of six stalls. I don't think I've ever been at a property with six stalls. Um, it's beautiful here, um, beautiful hotel, and um, there's quite a few amenities within walking distance. Uh, if you walk through uh, that clearance where that gentleman is, there, um, there is a big plaza over there with restaurants and shops and places to have breakfast. And it's a great stay. So now you know. Hello, Second Jesse. This is Holger from Austria again. I'm here in Germany at Oberhammerfeld. It's the biggest supercharger in Germany with 40 stalls, 20 V3 and 20 V2. There's a Vietnamese food, uh, you can get your nails done or a massage, uh, pizza, uh, then there's a Burger King and a fuel station. It's right next to the A3 highway. So I give it a Nine out of ten. Now you know. Hello. Hello, Zach and Jesse. This is uh, Alex recording from the Westland Hotel in Richmond, Virginia. 
Um, the hotel here has three Tesla destination chargers, and they also have uh, one Clipper Creek EV charging station. Uh, not much to do around here in the immediate vicinity, but there is a Walmart about half a block to the west of the charging station. Um, great hotel, great amenities. Love your show, and now you know. Thank you so much for doing those reviews. If you want to see more, you can head over to nowyouknowchannel.com and you can go to the Supercharger Reviews page. There you'll get a map. You'll be able to see all the Supercharger Reviews. You'll be able to upload your own Supercharger Review. I highly recommend you do that. We're making a really useful map for people if you're going on a long supercharging trip. All right, what do we got for new superchargers this week? We've got number 116 in Canada, the 8-stall version 3 at Salmon Arm in British Columbia. Number 21 in Indiana, the 12-stall version 3 in Fair Oaks, Indiana. Number 26 in Austria, the 12-stall version 3 in Eberstalzel, Austria. Number 30 in Illinois, the 12-stall version 3 in Highland Park. The 28-stall version 3 in Arvin, California. Number 102 in Germany, the 12-stall version 3 in Ottersburg, Posthausen. Number 11 in South Carolina is the 12-stall version 3 in St. George, South Carolina. Number 27 in Colorado is the 8-stall version 3 in Edwards. The 8-stall version 3 in Highland, California. The 8-stall version 3 in New Bern, North Carolina. Number 30 in North Carolina, the 8-stall version 3 in Garner, North Carolina. Number 239 in California is the 8-stall Urban in Montecito, California. Number 69 in Florida is the 16-stall version 3 at Port St. Lucie on Florida's Turnpike in Florida. And number 39 in New Jersey, number 1131 in the USA, number 2927 in the world is the 8-stall version 3 in Lodi, New Jersey. Wow. All right, it's time for our Patreon giveaway. We're giving away a $30 gift card to EcoWare. Remember, we completely offset your purchase, the life cycle, and the shipping of your product. When you buy a tea, we plant 10 trees and we cap a well. Who's the winner? The winner is Marlon Kevlar. Marlon, congratulations. You just won yourself a $30 gift card. Pick out anything you like, and we will get it to you. Wow. This is our first Tuesday show in a while. So comment down below if you liked it. Also hit the like button if you liked it. Um, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Uh, hit the bell notification. Share it with a friend. Um, uh, b b rent out a billboard. <laughs> <laughs> let, it, let everyone know that you like the show. Um, yeah, maybe that satellite billboard. You could put yeah, a little uh, billboard. Go on. support us on Patreon. I, I, We can't do the show without our, our wonderful patrons. Yeah. Uh, you're seeing them scroll past here. Um, it just doesn't work. Uh, YouTube doesn't work without Patreon. Nope. Um, we would have to make much dumber content. Yeah. I'm so glad that we have such an intelligent group of people who are willing to sit through an hour long video. Um, of of just straight news i'm just really glad that we there's some jokes in there it. it's not all straight news yeah i will sure <laughs> but i mean there's a lot of heady stuff there's a lot of really complicated concepts yeah. and uh i'm just it, and and if you count our now you know investor club stories and patreon stories mm -hmm. this week it's like over two hours of, of you're kind of i do want to say that you are kind of missing a lot yeah. of content um just try Patreon out, you know, just head on over there. Yeah, uh, see what you think. See what you think. It's only a buck a month. It's really, I, I, we really tried to make it as reasonable as possible. It just, it helps us out a lot, um, even that $1. And uh, it, it's, so just, yeah, give it give it a shot. See if there's some perks that you like. Um, you know, you can get one of these mugs if you want, yeah. um, as well as uh, lots of other fun perks that we have, including uh, uh we're, we have a book club. Um, we're going to be doing Power Play, that one that uh, Elon doesn't like. Yeah. Um, we'll be talking about why Elon doesn't like it. And if we think some of the stuff in it is true or not, you're going to have to join us on the book club if you want to hear more about that. Um, it's going to be coming up soon. So you got to you can get it on Audible. Um, that's not an Audible ad, but that's how I'm reading. That's how you're listening. Huh? Yeah. All right. We'll see you next week. Now you now know. You know.